if it's <laughs> if someone else wants to chime in, I'll say at the end of the show. Um, my name is Marie Scatina, and I am, please join us, and I facilitate this workshop series. Um, please join us. We have plenty of, plenty of room. Um, we have some refreshments in the back, so help yourself as, the, as we're talking. Um, and also, we have a sign-in sheet. Um, if you'd like to leave us with your um, contact information, we would dearly love to have that to alert you to other events as they as they occur. Um, this workshop series is hosted by ISERP and the Oral History Masters Program and it's held every Tuesday, every other Tuesday, I'm sorry, um, at about six o'clock. Um, so we have um, uh, Dr. Mindy Fullalove today and I'd like to introduce Dr. Fullalove and um, uh, I have to say um, Dr. Fullalove has been so generous with her time with uh, um, oral History Master's program that um, as soon as I finish my um, introduction, if any of the students would like to, to add something to the introduction, please feel free. Um, Dr. Mindy Fullalove is a research psychiatrist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute and a professor of clinical psychiatry and public health at Columbia University. She was educated at Bryn Mawr and Columbia and she is a board certified psychiatrist having received her training at the New York Hospital Westchester Division and Montefiore Hospital. She's conducted research on AIDS and epidemics of poor communities and with special interest in the relationship between the collapse of communities and decline in health. From her research, she has published the book Root Shock, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What We Can Do About That, and we'll be hearing more about that this evening, and The House of Joshua, Meditations on Family and Place, she is a co-author of Roderick, Wall Roderick Wallace's Collective Consciousness and Its Discontents, Institutional Distribu Distributed Cognition, Racial Policy, and Public Health in the United States. She has published as numerous articles and book chapters and mon monographs, and it received many, many awards, including Best Doctors List and two honorary doctorates. Um, her work in AIDS is featured in Jacob Levinson's The Secret Ec Epidemic, The Story of AIDS in Black America. And she is currently finishing a new book, Elements of Urban Restoration, Repairing American Cities After Blight, Flight, and Disinvestment. So please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Thank you. Any of you want to add anything? <laughs> Um, I was sharing with them some deep secrets, so I'm really mm -hmm. glad that stay between us. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today. What I wanted to talk about was uh, the problem of, of, of learning, of knowing. We go into the field to, to learn. And I, my work is as a qualitative researcher. So the idea of qualitative research is that, is the, the phil philosophy is that at a certain point, there is going to be some inductive leap, and you're going to understand things. So, the philosophers say that the difference between deduction and induction is that in deduction, the answer is in the data. So, the, the most famous syllogism in deductive reasoning, the basic one, is Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore, Socrates is mortal. So, all the things that you need to get to the answer are given to you. Whereas with induction, at a certain point, <coughs> there's a leap. And the answer is not in the data. Um, in my path to medical school, um, in the organic chemistry textbook, there was a um, footnote, there were two like kind of funny footnotes. But one was the story about how the guy who understood that the six carbons that are the basis of life were organized in a ring. 
and that was that he went to sleep and he had a dream, and in the dream, a snake grabbed his tail in his mouth. And so that circle was, he woke up and he was like, Eureka, I found it. So he knew there were six carbons, but how they were organized, he didn't know. So the answer was not in the data. He had to like find the answer, it popped into his head. So this is a, an interesting experience, and as a qualitative researcher, I've had this experience on a number of occasions where my head went pop. And um, so I just wanted to think about how do we, how do we understand that and, and, you know, sort of, this is more just uh, my musings on the subject of, you know, kind of what happens in your head when you're in the field. The, so the thing that I wanted to just talk about this sort of seeing what's in front of us, um, there are just a very short number of slides here. The, I got invited to Pittsburgh to do a project um, which had to do with a, I was actually a visiting fellow at the Graduate School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. And the project was initiated by community leaders who understood that HOPE 6 was coming to Pittsburgh. So HOPE 6 is a federal project which authorized the demolition of housing projects saying that were considered to be distressed communities. So the, the leaders in Pittsburgh had lived through urban renewal and they were suspicious of what this whole thing was going to be about. So they invited me to come and hang out and, and, and we all got involved in talking this through. So when I got to Pittsburgh, this is what I saw. So the neighborhood where all our meetings, this is the neighborhood where all our meetings were held. Not exactly on that street, but it's a typical shop. My uh, previous research had looked uh, a great deal at a, at a program called Plan Shrinkage. And Plan Shrinkage was important because I started my research career looking at AIDS in black and Hispanic communities in the United States. A major paper by Rod Wallace, um, whose book, Collective Consciousness, I'm a co-author of, a physicist who does work in human ecology, did some major work looking at the AIDS epidemic in the, in the United States, and particularly <coughs> how it spread in New York City. And his analysis demonstrated that the implementation of the policy of planned shrinkage in New York City in the 1970s spread AIDS. So planned shrinkage was a program that closed fire stations, preferentially in poor and minority neighborhoods. So the South Bronx, Harlem, Bed-Stuy, all these neighborhoods, the fire stations were closed. So that they would burn down and the people would be dispersed out of those neighborhoods and the areas would be cleared. So they planned to shrink the city by destroying some neighborhoods. They ever do that in France? No. <laughs> So, I mean, this policy is so strange loving that most people don't believe it. And, and so people, the, the urban myth is that the, and as soon as I say that to people, they're like, I know, I know, yes, the landlords committed arson. And, and what's interesting about that is, and it actually relates to what I'm talking about tonight, is that having just explained that the city government closed fire stations so that things would burn down. People say, oh yes, the landlords committed arson, the, which is the prevailing folk interpretation of what happened. What happens when you close fire stations is that it takes longer to get to a fire. Fires move through buildings exponentially. So any short delay increases the damage that will occur in a building. And so as opposed to a fire being contained in an apartment, it might go through several floors or through a whole building before the fire trucks get there. So closing fire stations is disastrous for the protection of the urban infrastructure. And poor neighborhoods have the worst code enforcement, the most overcrowding, the oldest housing stock, therefore the most vulnerable housing stock. So delay in getting to fires is very bad. There's a secondary process that was originally described by a geographer named Michael Deere, working in Philadelphia which is what's called contagious housing destruction. And that, he discovered that if you destroy one building, the buildings 
adjacent to it become very vulnerable. And so that destroying a building on one block puts all the buildings around it at risk. And then as, one, as that <coughs> block burns down, the buildings around that block get to be at risk. So not only does closing a fire station increase the risk of that building, if a building burns, the buildings around it will burn. So what New York City neighborhoods look like in the mid-90s was that. So this is a combination of various kinds of disinvestment. So plan shrinkage was a, a particular policy where they literally said, let's shrink the city, let's close the fire stations to move towards that goal. We'll clear some neighborhoods in poor minority neighborhoods. Uh, but not everybody said that so explicitly. They just did it. They just took everything out. I, I was working in Bayview Hunters Point in uh, San Francisco when the last institutional thing, which was a branch of Wells Fargo Bank, closed. Uh, so there was no place to get a sandwich. There was no place to. There was no place to do any. There was no supermarket. There was, there was no institutional supports for urban life without getting in a car and going someplace outside of the neighborhood. You couldn't walk to anything. So when I got to Pittsburgh and I was in the hill, I saw contagious housing destruction, disinvestment in contagious housing destruction. And that's how I read that landscape. And you, you would not be, if you see that landscape and you read it as disinvestment in the American context, you will always be right. But I had a disturbing experience, which was that these people in Pittsburgh kept talking about urban renewal. And I really, I knew about urban renewal. Um, but I was talking about disinvestment, and they were talking about urban renewal, and we were, it was, it, in my mind, it was a clash. So as I remember this, I kind of experienced it like this buzzing bee. <laughs> Not a bee, but like a fly or a mosquito. You know, you're trying to sleep at night, and a mosquito's trying to get you, and it's that really loud, scary, that, like, and you're, like, trying to kill it before it bites you, whatever. I experienced it kind of like that. So we can have the next slide. So one day, I was reading a magazine called Double Take, which was an artsy magazine, short-lived, beautiful artsy magazine. And they had a story about an African-American photographer from Memphis called Ernest Withers, who had taken tens of thousands of photographs of black life in Memphis, and, and he's very famous because uh, Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis, and he was taking pictures of the garbage strike and all, all that was going on around that time. So the the beautiful pictures of Martin Luther King leading the the march the day before or a couple days before his death are taken by Ernest Withers. He's also famous because it turns out he was an FBI informer. So uh, I guess that makes him infamous. But back to my story. In double take, there was this picture. I'm exaggerating. This picture was not in double take. This picture was on the internet. Because I couldn't find double take today. Mm -hmm. So, but it's all right. It just, you, now, what do you see in this photograph? Would you hate it very much if I made you go back? Thank you. So, this, and if we go forward, and this are two different eras. And they can be read with, if you, if you know the history of African American neighborhoods in the United States, with great assurance as being different, representing different social states. The, so what is important, everything that's, that's, everything that's important about the social state can be, can, should not be inferred from this photograph, but if you've read descriptions of what was going on, or if you, like me, are old and lived back then, you know what was going on. And that is that she is smiling, she's beautifully groomed and dressed. It's a well-tended store, a, a little lunch counter, 
and it was there to serve an African American community that had enough money to go to a nice lunch counter with a beautifully dressed and well coiffed waitress. Um, so all of these are signs of the state of health of that community. There's a paper that I, I think is an instant classic by a woman named Eva Maria Sims, which I'll be talking about as we go along. Anyway, she makes the she points this out as what I've come to call Sims One. Sims One is the period from 1930 to 1960 when things look like that. So, but to get back to me, I looked at that photograph and had a moment of incredible revelation. In Pittsburgh, there's a photographer named Charles Teeny Harris, who has the nickname One Shot. Char he has a, I mean, his second nickname is One Shot. Um, he was an African-American photographer who worked for the Pittsburgh Courier, and who took photographs between 1940 and 1970. And during that period of time, with his speed graphic, so a very large format camera, negative is 4 by 5 took 80,000 photographs. So that's not like me with my digital camera taking 80,000 a day. This is like, this is a lot of work. And he was called one shot because he would arrive and take one shot. His um, photographs are proudly displayed all over the hill. And therefore, the photographs of life in the hill were part of my experience of going to visit people's homes. And so I had seen this photograph, but it was taken in Pittsburgh. And in the way that, that my brain works in such moments, it, you, know, you know how safe crackers get to that moment where they, you know, all the tumblers, whatever the tumblers it is they do, they did, and the door opens. So I, I have this feeling of the tumblers tumbling, like they tumble and the door, that's how it feels to me, it tumbles and the door opens. Um, and what I realized in that moment was that African American communities that looked like that in the 1950s had existed all across the United States. So that African American people are organized in this archipelago because we've been confined to ghettos, but the ghettos are interconnected. So it's the, in the nation, within the nation, is not people clumped together, but in this complex archipelago. And that, so that what you saw in Memphis, you saw in Pittsburgh, and what you saw in Pittsburgh, you saw where I grew up, and you saw it in any black community where there were photographs, you would see that, some version of that photograph, that woman, upstanding, prosperous, well-dressed, in a nice store, serving her community with a smile. And that a huge number of those communities had lived through urban renewal between 1949 and 1973, when 2,500 projects were carried out in 1,000 cities, and two-thirds of the million people who were displaced were African American. Um, and so the, at the moment when the safe opened, what I realized with, in a way that stunned me, was what it meant to have that kind of carpet bombing of the African American people. Um, I've never had anybody understand what I was trying to say. I don't know that I'm even now terribly articulate about this. Um, I've never had anybody understand it better than a group of black Vietnam veterans that I had the honor to address in Washington, D.C. And they all said, yes, we did that in Vietnam. We carpet bombed the villages where we thought there were Vietnam. Many, many, many villages were taken out to destroy the strength of Vietnamese people. So th this whole process, this urban renewal, is not just one neighborhood or one city. And I, 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 think, I think I'm not alone 
in knowing there was urban renewal in Newark, where I grew up, a huge amount of urban renewal. But thinking of it as something that happened to my city, but not really realizing the extent to which it was happening to, let's just say, 1,600 African American <clears throat> neighborhoods across the United States. So what does that do to a people? Can we have the next slide? So, um, so Tini Harris left these 80,000 negatives, um, which are now in the Carnegie Library, um, sorry, in the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. And at this moment, as we speak, there's a massive exhibit of a thousand of his photographs displayed in chronological order, which I got to see on Saturday. But I had seen many of his photographs before. Um, they've had a, a number of smaller exhibits, and they've been doing very extensive work to get the, the help of the people of Pittsburgh to identify the photographs. They, they weren't well cataloged. So they've been trying to catalog them with the help of local people who were there. And so, they had books of the photographs that you could look through, and I also worked with them to get there are quite a number of photographs by Tini Harris that are in my book, Rootshock. So I spent quite a bit of time with the, the kinds of documents that were available. <coughs> um, but the, the exhibit is fabulous. It's in three huge rooms. So, if you can see, all the way at the end, there's a slide. So when you first come in, it's a large room with benches, very, really big room, really big benches. And there are themes, and there are one, two, like eight themes, and each theme has a slideshow. So the, what we see in front of us is the theme, the rise and fall of the Crawford Grill. And so all of the photographs related to the rise and fall of the Crawford Grill, which was the preeminent jazz spot in the hill, are playing on that. There's another one called Gatherings, and so all the, all the photographs related to that are playing. So it's huge. Now remember, this is a speed graphic, so that the amount of information that's on the negative is phenomenal. So a wall size projection is so exquisite, because you can get to see everything that's there. And I mean, you could just spend days just in that room. In the next room, the same photographs are displayed on a smaller version on the wall by year. So it starts, I believe, in 1940, and then there are selected photographs from each year. And there's an occasional commentary. So, for example, we'll say African Americans were 50% of this, I'm making this up, but 50% of the steel workers in this year. Um, so, so it helps you to track what's happening in the embedding context of this community. And what's evident in a, in a way that we have never seen before, and if you are a historian and you're going to do any work on the African American community, you have to go see this, these photographs, you have to work in this archive. Um, but what we have never seen before is anybody who has documented as seriously the complexity and the just plain fun of the African American community as it existed in that period, some, the Sims 1 period. So there's everything you can imagine. So there's guys coming back from the deer hunt with venison for the neighborhood. There's a guy who pushes his piano along to play on the streets. There's uh, cross-dressers. There's boxers. There's people in the bar. There's musicians. There's famous people. On and on and on and on. The, the dense, complex variety of life, the things that people were interested in doing, is almost without limit. And what's fascinating about Teeny Harris I think is that he took pictures of everything. How many people take pictures of everything? I, I think people fall into themes. If you had a look at my photo archive, I mean, you don't really want to ever do that in your life, but it would all be like boring buildings, uh, you know, really zero interest. Um, 
but Teeny Harris took pictures of everything. And so imagine 80,000 photographs. So remember, he's called one shot. <coughs> so it's in theory 80,000 unduplicated photographs, which means that it's 80,000 shot. How do you take 80,000 pictures in a neighborhood and not bore people? Well, the answer is it was a really interesting neighborhood. Now, we also know that this was an interesting neighborhood because it's the inspiration for August Wilson's cycle of plays. This, this is the Hill District. Extraordinary place. So we get to 1960, and something happens. And that something is urban renewal. And the way they show urban renewal is both through the rise and fall of the Crawford Grill, which is depicted in a series of photographs of the demolition of the building until the area is bare. Um, and also the rise of the Civic Arena. Civic Arena is um, the urban renewal cleared land that was blighted. Blight was a cancer that was going to destroy the city. So this amazing, interesting, complex neighborhood worthy of of Pulitzer Prize winning plays and 80,000. I mean, this guy is going to be the most important African American photographer of the 20th century. There's no doubt about it. So, worthy of depiction in those ways, this neighborhood was blight and a cancer in the city. And it was cleared with bulldozers so that a, a civic arena could be built. It had the distinction of having a retractable roof. And it had a retractable roof because the department store magnate, Edgar Kaufman, who, for whom Frank Lloyd Wright built Falling Water, liked to hear civic light opera in the out of doors. So, um, and it just turned out that there were high winds and the protectable roof didn't work, so it was um, rarely opened. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're in the museum with a friend of mine, and he's telling me this story about all the different concerts he heard at the Civic Arena. He said most of them could have been anywhere but except one. And he starts telling me about this this concert, and it was very smoky because everybody in there was stoned, and so they opened the retractable roof to clear all the smoke, and it started to pour. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so then they had to close the retractable roof. Anyway, that that's a unique thing. So the Civic Arena is erected, and so there are two things. One is a map of the of the streets, and a circle of where the Civic Arena goes. <coughs> And then a long series of photographs of the erection of the Civic Arena, where this neighborhood used to be. Can we have the next? There's a third room where there's a slideshow going on with voiceovers. This is after the, after the Crawford Grill has been cleared. So this is the last days of the Lower Hill as the African American, historic African American. So th this is this is what people were, were talking about. I just want to make a small point, which is that this, can we have the next slide? Is the Lower Hill. So the Crawford Grill was on Wiley Avenue. This is Wiley Avenue. So the Crawford Grill was about there. So the Civic Arena is sitting on the Crawford Grill. When people were talking about urban renewal, they were talking about this. But when I was visiting, I was visiting in this territory a little further up in what's called the Middle Hill. So this is where you have the development of contagious housing destruction. And so the life of the neighborhood continued in a different place. So this was no longer part of the African American community. It had been taken for white use, pretty much white only use. And so African American people that I was working with did not go there. And I was hanging out with them. So I went where they went. So I never went there. So what they were talking about was something I did not see. And it took a long time 
before the, what I was hearing about and what I was seeing, the complexity of this terrain and its history was evident to me. So, so the point at which I'm seeing Ernest Withers' photographs somehow helps me overcome the limitations of my, my own lived experience and enter fully into what people were trying to get me to understand what happened to me. According to, so even Maria Sims had um, an epiphany herself. Um, she doesn't describe the tumblers, tumblers rolling on the safe in her mind, but what she says in a paper that's in Humanistic Psychology in 2008, which, uh, you know, see the Teeny Harris exhibit, read Eva Maria Sims' paper. Um, she says that phenomenologists, and they, they, they like to know how people experience things. So she went to the Hill District to learn how people play as children. And, you know, so, I mean, really the questions that are on their mind are, you know, did you build a hut in the woods, and you know, how many other kids were in your neighborhood, and what games you, uh, phenomenologists like to, to describe those things in very exquisite terms. When she came back with her data, and she sat down and analyzed it, she was startled to find that the data said something quite different from what she expected, and that was that the people who had grown up in different years, so she interviewed people between 1930 and 2004, had remarkably different experiences. So growing up between 1930 and 1960, the era before urban renewal was an era of this dense, positive, productive, interesting, complicated, thriving neighborhood. Jane Jacobs talks a lot about uh, cities, Jane Jacobs in Death and Life of Great American Cities, talks a lot about the fact that cities that work are good places for people who have plans of their own. And if you ever wanted to see, you know, so what does that mean, people have plans of their own? Th these photos of Teeny Harris, which are actually all on the internet. Um, not all, but a huge selection on the internet. Um, you know, like, let's go deer hunting and bring the deer back and feed the hungry. This is not my plan, right? But there were guys, and they had a truck. It was the annual <coughs> feed the deer, deer for food, something. They had a title for this day. Um, the a lot of people had different, a lot of different plans. All there. So if you were growing up in that first era, you grew up in a, a dense, dense, dense set of relationships. That you were looked after by all of the adults and you existed in a posse of all the kids. These people were intensely socialized and they were socialized to think about community. They were, they were socialized to be responsible for their entire group. They were socialized to be problem <coughs> solvers. They were socialized to be positive citizens. They were supposed to socialized to be clean, upstanding. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't some criminals, blah, blah, but it was not out of control. It was not uncontained. So, and Tini Harris has pictures of the numbers runners and the murders and the this and that. She just took pictures of everything. Mm -hmm. So, 1960, with urban renewal, also at that time, Pittsburgh is beginning to deindustrialize, so African Americans are losing their jobs in the steel mills. We go into a new era, Sims II, which extends to 1984. Sims II is a period of fraying of the networks. It's the whole loss of the lower hill. People are moving into the middle hill. The middle hill is starting to burn down. In the middle of that period, there are the riots. In, in response to the riots, Pittsburgh cuts many of the existing roads in and out of the Hill District to isolate it, to you know, kind of contain the black people. Um, and so people no longer have the sense that, they're, that they're, we're all in it together. It's a, a different, it's on a different trajectory. And between 1984 and 2004, 
is when she dates, it might be 1980 to 2004, is when she dates Sims 3. And that's characterized by what one of the people she interviews tells her is his sense of unexpectancy, which is a remarkable, she points out a remarkable neologism. So when, I, when I go out of my door, he says, I, I don't know what's going to happen. And it's like, look to the left, look to the right, see what's going on, hope you don't get shot, but you don't know that you can get safely from your house to wherever you're going next. So the, the kind of wandering around, exploring the woods, being with other people, we're in this together, I can trust you because you're in the hill with me. Whoever you are, if you're the numbers runner, you're a criminal, you're still going to take care of me because I'm a little kid, that's gone. And now it's just this sense of fear. So, So, it, Sims 3 is really a period when, as opposed to all the adults raising all the children, you're down to a, a single mother raising kids without much help from neighbors or friends or family. So that both the strong ties and the weak ties have been shattered, and people are living in very isolated, very frightened communities. <coughs> So, can we have the next slide? Is there a next slide? Okay. Oh, excellent. Okay. So, just to, so this is Sims 3. That, that's what I'm, you know, so, so we're seeing as, as, as we can put these stories together, as we understand urban renewal and we understand, we understand this long process. We realize, I realize, that this is not simply contagious housing destruction, it is contagious housing destruction, but it's not simply contagious housing destruction. And uh, ultimately, we're, we're really forced to rename what we're seeing, and because there's a series of displacements and upheavals and destructions that are going on, and we come to call that serial displacement. So, so, I was in, so I, as I've said, I was in Pittsburgh this past weekend, and um, I was touring around with, with an architect who's worked a lot in Braddock. So Braddock is another devastated little, was a steel city, steel, important steel mill there, 35,000 people, almost everybody depended on the steel mills, steel mills closed massive deindustrialization and the town collapsed. There, there are now about 2,000 people that live in Braddock. Braddock is devastating. So, um, so the architects who were working there, first major investment on Main Street in Braddock, um, putting up a building. And part of the building is going to be parking. So it's going to present a blank wall to the street. So for architects, and people who are trying to do urban restoration, this is an important thing. That here's a, a here's a main street where the buildings are mostly gone, a lot of vacant lots, and what buildings there are are mostly closed. So there's not much there to give the street that three-dimensional existence that makes it really look like a street. Um, Jane Jacobs has the expression that buildings are the natural proprietors of the street. And as the owners of the street, they're not supposed to turn their back on the street. So, so these architects are, they're, they're convinced of this. They're not going to, they're not fooling around with that. So that means that this part where there's going to be parking, there's going to be a blank wall to the street. You have to have something to deal with that. You, you have to, you have to own the building. This is the first new construction in 20 years. It has to own the street. Well, how do you do that when you have a blank wall? So they come up with the idea of an art project. And they call in a citizen's commission to say, so what should the art be? Um, and what's remarkable is that the citizens who are on this art commission get together. And basically, for 45 minutes, they're telling stories, sharing stories with each other about growing up in Braddock, living in Braddock, loving Braddock. 
And so then there's a second meeting and they tell more stories. And there's a third meeting. And the architect is scratching his head and saying, this, you're not getting anywhere. So we're going to get this project done. What are we going to do for the art? And then he as a light bulb goes off, go off. And he realizes that the stories are, are the project. That what has to be said on Main Street is that this is a beloved place. And so there are a series of panels by this artist, Robert Coulters, that were made by collaboration among the developer, the architect, and the people of Braddock, and the artist. Um, and in this one, this one is called Parades. So in Braddock, he said, we had great parades in Braddock. I remember the time we did something. We rode on the ladder truck. We all sat right on the ladders and took candy to everyone. There were so many people on the sidewalks. I miss the good times. What they talk about with the parade, you see the t-shirt Braddock rules, was that Main Street was two miles long and the parades would go on for five hours. <laughs> now, what they're hearkening back to is Braddock 1. That, that's their roots, Braddock 1. But they, wanted, they want you to know, just the way the people in the Hill District put up Teeny Harris's photos, so where we're coming from. We love this place because of that. That's what we lived. It's, that's the legacy of the place. And so these art panels are proudly displayed on the sides of this building. And in front of every panel, there's a bench. Now, and the bench is facing the panel. So you could sit on the bench and look at the panel. I had a student. So back in the 90s, when there were a lot of murders going on, who studied memorial walls all over New York City. And one of the interesting things about memorial walls that she found was that there were several kinds of ways people went to the space of the memorial. One was that people would sit and be the guardians of the space. The second was that people would just pass through, because they were just going to the store. They weren't there to deal with the memorial. And the third was that people came to grieve or to connect. If you've ever visited the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall or seen pictures of it, you'll notice it's the same structure. That that there are, you can be you can just walk through, you can stand and be a guardian, or you can touch it, you can leave presence, you can you can find your lost loved ones there. So in organizing this, they created mourning space um, for, for people to, so, so what, is, what are public memorials of this kind? What are, what are they doing for us? Um, and why did the architects provide that for the people of Braddock as this first new construction on Braddock Avenue, owning the street, the proprietors of the street? I mean, it's both the loss and the assertion that we claim it. Because when we put up a memorial to somebody, we make it clear we do not want to forget. We will remember this. We will take it into our DNA of the future. And so these pictures do that. So my goal here was just to describe this. this uh, cognitive process of induction, which is a mystery to us. It's a black box. So the light goes off and we don't know why. Right? Do I actually told you four stories. The guy who discovered the carbon ring and how I came to recognize that Ruchak was a national process and how even Maria Sims learned about these three errors and how uh, Dan Rothschild realized that the stories were the project for the art. So I think induction is very common in our experience of trying to move through the world as creative people. It's curious um, and it's not programmed. It's not something we can say, okay, I've got all the data, let me sit down, let me do my analysis, and then I'll know the answer. Uh, has not been my experience that you know the answer. So I was sharing with the um, oral history students that during this time in, in Pittsburgh, uh, I, so I'm driving down, I'm driving down Main Street. I'm driving down Main Street with a Dan Rothschild's partner, Ken Doino, and 
I'm looking at all the vacant lots on Braddock Avenue. And he's telling me about all the buildings that are built. So it's, it's not what I'm seeing is what, what I'm hearing is not what I'm seeing. And I, I remember when I was giving this lecture on like listening carefully. So I'm like, wait, I have to listen carefully. <laughs> I actually said that to myself. I, like, I have to listen carefully. And then I'm listening carefully, and I'm like, this is a disconnect. Because this place is nothing but, I mean, it's just short of rubble. Mm -hmm. like it, it, I mean, it's not pretty. And he's talking about this very positive stuff. And I'm like, do, do you think about these vacant lots? And he said, no. And the, the tumblers rolled, and the door opened. And I, and I got something I've been trying to get for a long time, which is, you may have read articles, people are saying, oh, we have to do plan shrinkage in Youngstown, we have to do plan shrinkage in Detroit. And I'm always saying, I, I don't know if you want to do that because that's how we got the worldwide AIDS epidemic and maybe you ought to chill that out. That's a bad idea. But, but then the people say, well, what do you do? And the, there are a lot of vacant lots in those cities. What do you do? Um, so what I got in that moment suddenly on Braddock Avenue was the people who have the clearest vision are not looking at the vacancy. That, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at the love. So uh, <coughs> love conquers all is the answer for the American city, in my view. And then our job as people who, for me as a psychiatrist and as a clinician looking at these injured spaces, is how do we, how do we lift that up? How do we tell those stories? How do we share them? How do we affirm the dignity and the, and the contributions of people who have been so badly abused by our society that their cities were So that is what I wanted to show with you. Now, by the way, it was a very intense experience. It was like, I can't even begin to describe. I tried to describe it to them. It was very intense. And uh, it was quite psychedelic. I had a lot of fun yesterday. I'm still tripping a little bit. I'm trying to be cool, talking a little bit. <laughs> so induction can be, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a thing when it happens in your head. But it's how it happens. So as I like to say in short, to my students when I'm teaching qualitative research, the answer is not in the data, which doesn't mean you don't have to know your data. But the answer is just going to come through you as if you are a channel. Um, in the St. Francis prayer, Lord, make me a channel of thy peace. So this is, Lord, make me a channel of thy love so I can see how to help. Thank you for your attention. And now, I've asked some people to co-present with me, and we collected some stories in our work together. So we have two storytellers who will take over at this point, and then we'll open it up for, just, just, to, just to show that this is happening to all of us. Sarah or Kayla, you want to um, This one's actually very short. <coughs> also, the, the way that it works, we didn't, where I'm not telling my own story, I'm telling somebody else's story. Um, the story is that when one